and visitors. But today is Father's Day, and I'd like to recognize a father. So if you're a father, will you please stand and, and, and just be honored? And, and, and church, let's give them a round of applause. Amen. Amen. I'd like for y'all to stay standing, please. Stay standing. And church, I'd like to say a prayer. So let, let's bow our heads in prayer. Father God, thank you for all your grace and your mercy, Father. Father, today, hold up all the fathers to you, Father. Father, and I ask you to be with them, Father. Father, I pray for the fathers that are struggling, Father, with how this fatherhood thing works, Father. Father, I pray for the busy ones who struggle home, life, and work, Father. Father, I pray, Father, for those that don't know you, that they do know you, Father. Father, I pray that you give fathers the strength to remain steadfast, Father, the courage to speak the truth in loving kindness, Father. Father, I pray that you watch over these fathers today, Father, and in the future that they continue to be the men of God that you have called them to be. It's all of this we say and we, we ask and we lift up in your name, Father. Amen. Amen. Thank you, gentlemen. You may be seated. To our first-time visitors, again, it is an honor to have you here at the end of the service. Our pastor would love the opportunity to meet you, greet you, put a free gift in your hand. But in, in the seat back in front of you, there's a welcome card. I would ask that you fill this out uh, w just with your name and phone number, maybe email address, because uh, we'd like to reach out to you if you have any prayer requests or anything that's on your mind about our church. If we can answer any questions, we are available. But most importantly, we want to know you and we want to pray for you. And, and so, again, for first-time visitors uh, or if you're just a member or regular attender that has a prayer request, fill this out. Put it in the, in the offering uh, receptacles, and, and we'll be sure to lift these up. Hopefully, as, as a first-time member, as a first-time visitor, you've been needed to met and greeted as you came in. But our members and regular attenders would love the opportunity to meet you, greet you. So we have a crazy way of doing that around here. We ask you to stay seated. Members, regular attenders, let's get from where you are and greet those that are new. Amen. If you could go back to your seats, do not sit down. You can remain standing. But if you could return to your seats, let's pray. Father God, we, we, we just thank you, Father. Father, Father, we ask that you just speak to each and every one of us individually today. Father, let us block out the things, Father, that, that weigh us down, Father, and give them to you, Father. Father, let us the promises that you've given each and every one of us, Father. Father, I pray today, Father, those people that are struggling, Father, they just lean on you, Father, for your understanding, not our own understanding, Father. Father, I pray again, Father, that we just have conference with you today, Father. And you seek to, you just search our hearts out, Father. We ask all this in your precious name. Amen. Thank you. 
Worship you, God of mercy and grace. It is you. We adore. It is you. Praises are for only you. The heavens declare.
All right, we've got a new soundboard in, so we're working through all the glitches this morning, and we'll continue over the next few weeks, I'm sure, working out all the, the changes and glitches. If you do get it kind of where you get a signal, give me a thumbs up back there. And we're talking about prayer today. We're continuing that message, but I thought it was an appropriate day. I, I was thinking about going to a Father's Day message because it's Father's Day, and which I normally do do a Father's Day message. But I got to personally thinking, what better message than to talk about prayer as we're talking about our Heavenly Father because there's so many things about him that we as fathers should desire to be. I mean, he, he's the pattern, all right? He, he's the goal. He's the standard by which we should be living our lives as dads. And we are his children. We will follow his action and his righteous life and his righteous behavior towards his family 
it certainly should inspire us as men of God to be what God's called us to be as fathers in the world that we live in. It's amazing how God treats his children with such compassion and such grace. So as we, we'll continue talking about prayer, but I, I want that to kind of be in your heart and your, in your mind too as we talk about prayer. Let's stand and we honor the reading of the word today. We're going to go back to, uh, find this little thing down here, to the scriptures in Matthew where the Lord's given us the, the Lord's prayer and the and let's read it out loud with me if you'd like to. It says, pray, pray then in this way. Our Father who is in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as also we have forgiven also our debtors. And do not lead us into temptation, but deliver us from evil for What was that last word? Amen. You may be seated. We talk about this prayer. Remember, this is the disciples have caught Jesus, I would think, in my own sanctified imagination that he's walking away from, not yet, that he's, let's try it now. All right. How's that? No better? Much better? All right. Praise the Lord. I'll put this over here. in that day's past. Certainly that ought to be the model of every one of our lives. But apparently it was such an impact upon them that they come back to this Lord teaches how to pray. As we've gone through the prayer, we've looked at this not as a, a prayer we recite every day because that's not the way it was intended. It was intended for us to look at the biblical principles that are in this prayer when Jesus said, I want you to pray in this kind of manner, in this way. In other words, it's things that we should learn and should often come back to the Lord's prayer to see what it is that Jesus spoke to the Father about and how he wanted us to speak to the Father. Because obviously this prayer about forgiving his sins and debts, that wasn't an issue. But he's teaching it to the disciples. Here's how you should pray. And he gives them clarity on how they should pray. And certainly as we get to this part, I mean, we've talked about this, this, the aspect of, of how this starts with worship and then how it moves from there to intercession and the, the kingdom being will being done out and God's will being done out in the world today. We've talked about the aspect of supplication. We're saying, give us this day our daily bread. And then it comes to these verses in 12 and 13 that are so important, especially chapter, verse 12 is what we'll look at mostly today, where he talks about forgiving us our debts as we have forgiven others also of their debts that, that, that uh, are trespasses they hold against us. So I want to look at this, and I think that we need to understand as we look at this is really a message on forgiveness, all right? And it's an important message on forgiveness. And I think we have to embrace this because our attitudes towards others is really an indication of our attitudes towards God. And you say, what does that mean? I mean, if God, if I really respect God and I really honor God in my life, then I'm going to respect and I'm going to honor what God says and what I should be doing and how I should be living my life and how I should be living in the relationships. God has set the, the standard of how he deals with his relationships. And he says he's forgiven us of our debts. And Jesus is showing us in simple terms there has to be the same attitude of forgiveness. I mean, it's coming to the place with forgiveness is I would care about you more than I did care about what you did to me. All right? And I think it's a great illustration of the prodigal son. And I'll just give you this illustration. But, it, but it's so simple because we're familiar with the prodigal son and how he left home. You know, and did a very, he, he goes to his father, very selfish attitude, very offensive. He goes off and does his own thing. He comes back, and the father's expectantly waiting and receiving him. He didn't go down and lecture him, did he? He just opened his arm, killed the fatted calf. There was, this, there was this, this powerful picture of forgiveness of a heavenly father 
who waits for us to come to him, who knows that we're sinners, who knows that we're going to act the way we did, and he gives us this, this illustration how it's, it's more about caring for a person than caring about what they did. And this is the demonstration he gives us, you know. He wasn't uptight when the son came home. He didn't freak out. He, you know, he cared more about this missing son than he did about everything else. He's not freaked out. Forgiveness brings us to the place where we literally release somebody else. We give up what we might call our pound of flesh or our, our power play by keeping, keeping something, you know, to hold over them. We're willing to remove it from them. People say, well, you know, I... If I do that, if I forgive this person, I'm just letting them off the hook. You're really not letting them off the hook. You're saying, I trust you, God, to deal with this. I think a lot of times we leave that element out of it, that God is a just God, and he's a righteous God, and he knows how to deal with people. I don't understand people. I'm not omniscient. I can't see into people's motives and hearts. I may think I do, but I really don't. You know, but the Lord knows the thoughts and the intents of every person. He sees the right attitudes. He sees the wrong attitudes. So what I'm saying is, I'm not going to judge this person. That's all God's business. He'll do with it as he wants. But I'm going to release this person, and I'm going to, you know, I, I'll, I'll take the difficult path. And, and I don't know if you've been offended, especially in a very big way. It is a difficult path, and it is costly to forgive somebody. You, you pay that emotional cost, that, 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 that mental cost. I mean, there's, just, there's a part of it that you just have to, of giving up yourself and releasing an offender without making them suffer according to whatever you think that that schedule might be that they should suffer. It's saying, I give this over to the Lord. I mean, if, if, if one hurts you, then you in turn hurt the other person back, and then you say, I forgive you, you, you really haven't forgiven them, have you? You're going in there and you're saying, okay, you did this to me, so I'm going to do this. And so you do back to them what they did to you or some form of it, and you say, now I forgive you. That's not what it's talking about here. That's not forgiveness. It's not draw your ounce of blood or whatever it might be and then do it. This is coming to the place of just saying, you know, uh, I'm going to take this person, and I, you're the innocent person in the situation. I'm going to release them and my own indignation and any evil, you know, uh, that I might have towards doing to them disregarding the evil they've done to me, I'm going to take, and I'm going to, I'm going to take this situation and I'm going to turn it over to God and I'm going, to, I'm going to tell the person that they're forgiving and I'm going to give it up. I'm going to give up my wrath towards them. I'm going to give up my indignation toward them. I'm going to turn them literally over to the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, the ultimate picture of that is seen where? At the cross, right? Here's Jesus who's done no wrong, but yet we continue to do wrong. The Bible says even while we were yet sinners... In our sin, Christ died for the ungodly. Even while I was a sinner, Jesus paid the price. He gave it up for me and for you. And now he's telling us that we should do the same thing. Now, I know a lot of people look at this thing of forgiveness and they oh, it's got to be something difficult. It's got to be something mystical, part of the Christian faith. I just can't perhaps grasp for some degree, you know. But it's a it's attainable and it's doable and it's not mystical. It's an action that you have to take in your own heart and in your own life to say, I'm going to go ahead and feel the pain here and I'm going to go ahead and take the heat on this. I'm going to go ahead and be offended by this, but I'm not going to react in a way that's going to cause grief and I'm not going to require my particular revenge upon that person. I'm going to let it go and I'm just going to turn this in faith over to the Lord. And that is an important part. You're really releasing this person to the Father. God, you're God of all creation, not me. I didn't create them. You did. Uh, they're not my responsibility, all right? They're your responsibility, and I'm going to let this go, and I'm going to let this to God. Listen, if, if you seek, and we've talked about this often at different times, but when you seek to carry grudges, you know, and over the offenses that you had, it really doesn't do much to the other individual. Who, who's it really hurting, and who, who's it affecting? It's affecting you. It warps your life. It, it, it burdens your life. It, it creates this spirit of unforgiveness that leads to the spirit of bitterness and defilement. And then out of that comes all these other kind of things that go on in our life. Listen, God wants to bring us to a place of victory and God wants to bring us to a place of freedom where I'm not having some kind of mental crisis and collapse when I think about how someone's offended me and I just can't get over it. You know, that burns up a lot of emotional energy. It burns up a lot of spiritual energy. It burns up a lot of physical energy in your life. And it keeps you in a place of bondage in your own life. You can't carry those things. The Bible says we should beware lest a brood of bitterness should spring up in us. And not only, it said not only spring up, it will defile many. What's that mean? In other words, you get offended 
And so now you let that fester to the point it, becomes to, it begins to pour out your mouth, all right, and you begin to share that offense with other people that had nothing to do with the offense to start with, and now they're becoming embittered on your behalf. Uh, we talked about taking up an offense before. That's a hard place to live your life. So Jesus says to us, talking about prayer, all right, learning how to pray, he says, and forgive us our debts as we also have forgiven our debtors. Now, hold on there. He's not talking about your credit cards. You say, I'm not paying my bill this month. I just told the Lord to forgive me of my debts. <laughs> so I'm debt-free, praise the Lord, all right? This is not debts in that context, all right? This has to do with, you know, the issues of your heart and of your life that are not right with God, you know, and, and, and sins and offenses towards God that you've done. In fact, you know, there's, about, there's, there, there's several words. This is one when he talks about debts. It's ophelima in, in the Greek language. It's one of five New Testament terms that the Greeks used to, to describe sin. We've talked about some of these in the past. I'm just going to go over them real quickly. Another word for sin, for debts like this, is the word harmatia. It's the most common word we see in Scripture. And it carries with it the idea of, we've talked about missing the mark, falling short of the glory of God. It misses the mark. It, you know, sin causes us to live in such a way we can't please God. All right? It's, it's, ruined, it's ruined our life. And when we commit acts of sin, it just means greater defeat and greater separation. Another word is peptoma, and it's rendered often most rendered is the word trespass. It's the sin of uh, slipping or falling. It results m more from carelessness than from intentional disobedience. We used this word a few weeks ago when I preached on if you see a brother caught in a trespass, you know, ye which are spiritual, restore such a one. That was the word that was used. In other words, they didn't have this in, they didn't go out with a mindset to just go commit this particular sin, but they ended up doing it, all right? So that's the word, that's another word. There's another word called parabasis, and this Greek word refers to stepping across the line, going beyond the limits. In other words, the Lord said, thou shalt not, and we said, I think I will anyway. <laughs> we stepped over the line and did what we knew we should not have done. We transgressed. We stepped over the boundaries that God had laid out for us. That's a conscious sin. That's an intentional sin, you know, and it's more intentional than these other words like harmatia and, and peptoma. Then there's a, one more word, anomia. And it means lawlessness. And this is like flagrant, you know, intentional sin, you know, just wickedness and, you know, it's arrogance or it's violence on your part and you just go out and, and you do it anyway. But the word being used here for debt in this particular passage is the way it reads in the English language is this word of philema. And it's used only a few times in the New Testament. In verb form of this particular word is found a lot of different times. But 30 times when it's used in the verb form, 25 times it's used to talk about moral or spiritual debts. And there we have to understand that when there's sin in our heart, we've disobeyed the Lord in our life. That is a moral and a spiritual debt that has to be paid, all right? You paid. It has to be paid. Now, we know that Jesus Christ, when he died on the cross, those words were, you know, paid for. You know, it was the words that he gave from the cross. This, it's, this redemption's done, the price has been paid, it's, it's finished, it's paid for. Telestai is the word that's used in the scriptures. We know that Jesus Christ paid our sin debt. You know, we used to sing a song, you know, we owed a debt we couldn't pay, he paid a debt he didn't know. That's what he's talking about here. You, we have this debt. So he's not saying, Lord, forgive us of our credit card use, which probably that wouldn't be a bad prayer to start with. But <laughs> But Lord, forgive us of our debts as we've forgiven those who have these debts against us. Now, if you study this passage in Luke, when Luke writes it down in the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, he uses the word harmatia, so it's clearly indicating that he's not talking about a financial obligation here or a financial debt. Matthew probably used this particular word, I believe obviously because of the inspiration of Scripture, but it's the most common Aramaic term of the, of the, of the time for sin that was used by the Jews of the day, which represented moral or a spiritual debt to God, all right? This is a moral obligation. There's four elements I want to bring out on this particular prayer, all right? Four things I want to look at quickly this morning. One is the problem that's presented in this prayer. Two is the provision. Three is the plea. The fourth thing I'll talk about is the prerequisite, all right? So let's look at those briefly this morning. First of all, the problem. I think most of us are familiar with the problem. Is it a secret to anybody that all have sinned and come short to the glory of God? I mean, even a non-religious person, if you were asked them, have you ever, if you believe God, they say, yeah. Do you realize, do you, have you ever done things that you know that God would not be pleased with? Yeah, that's sin, all right? 
sin, it's, it's, the, it's the common uh, problem for all humanity. It is that which separates us from God. It is man's greatest enemy. And if it's my greatest enemy, then it's my greatest problem, is this issue of sin that has to be dealt with. It dominates my mind. It dominates our hearts. It dominates, it seeks to contaminate us in every way, in every form. Every person born into the world is born with the same problem. We've all sinned. We've all fallen short of the glory of God. It is that very thing that is degenerative in its powers. It works in our life, contaminating in, in, in its effect upon our life. It's what makes us stumble. It's what makes us susceptible to disease. It's what makes us susceptible to, to illness and to Satan and what makes us susceptible to every form of evil that can be imagined. It makes us susceptible for unhappiness, makes us susceptible to a temporal kind of life. Things are always changing around us, which we have no control and we're defeated by. Sin has done its dirty work. The ultimate result of sin is pretty simple. It's death and damnation, all right? In the present effects of sin are misery, dissatisfaction, guilt. Now, I'm going to use a four-letter word here that most churches won't use in sermons today because it's so offensive to so many people. It's the word hell. But I must inform you, it's my obligation under divine mandate to stand and to warn everybody who does, know, who does not know Christ Jesus personally, that they are in danger of hell and damnation and condemnation for all eternity. Why? Because we've all sinned and we've all fallen short of the glory of God, all right? And here's the problem. We talk about a problem. You can't do a thing about it. Somebody has done something about it for you, though. But if you ignore what they've done, then you've got bigger problems to deal with than what you probably realize. It's, it has an effect upon us like a disease that has no cure. The scripture says in Jeremiah, can the Ethiopian change his skin or the leopard his spots? You also can do, do good who are accustomed to do evil. The idea is that you can't change how you were born any more than a leopard can change his spots or a skunk can change his stripes. You know, that's what they are. He's saying we're all sinners. All right? We're all just sinners. No matter who we are, no matter where we are, no matter where we're born, no matter what our skin color is, we all come in sinners with the same problem, needing the same antidote, which is the blood of Jesus Christ. So there's nothing I can do about it. But God can do something about it. There's nothing you can, you can work up. There's no amount of effort you can make. There's no amount of repentance that you can personally go through to access this on your own. It's just not going to happen. But what happens? If we trust Jesus Christ, you got that? There's no way around this. If you're looking for another answer, there's no way. If we trust Jesus Christ, he will deal with the problem we're facing because he has paid the price for pardon from that eternal place called hell, from that eternal place of damnation, all right? So when I come to Christ, literally, to ask him for forgiveness, it can be resolved because he paid the price. The wages of sin is what? It's death. And he died for me so I can experience eternal life. So we have this immeasurable need in my life. One, if we went back a verse or two and talked about what we talked about last week, daily bread. I gotta, I gotta live, right? But greater than my need for daily bread is my need for forgiveness. My need to have a heart that's washed clean, a life that's made new by the grace of God and by the mercy of the Lord Jesus Christ. I have lived in sin. I am a sinner by nature. Therefore, something has to happen to me, which I can't make happen to myself. Jesus Christ does for me and with me. The Bible says, if any man's in Christ, he is a new creation. Old things are passed away. All things are made new. We're under debt. We're obligated because of our sin. Who's going to pay the debt? I can't because I'm sinful. But Jesus Christ can. He is the ultimate provision for the problems that we face in this regard to this issue of sin. If my greatest problem is sin, the greatest need is forgiveness, 
And praise God, that's exactly what he provides. I have been forgiven. When I came to Jesus Christ, when you came to Christ, if you've come to Christ, then you were forgiven from, for the ultimate penalty of your sin. That has been removed. You don't have to face death and hell in the grave like those who have not Christ in their life. If you don't have Christ, grave's going to be miserable. Death's going to be miserable. For the Christian, death is just a doorway. We just step through it into the presence of God. Forgiveness, by the way, is the central theme of this passage of scriptures as Jesus is teaching. Forgiveness is the important element here. He said, we, we are pray, therefore, Lord, forgive us. Forgive us. In fact, if you go to verses from 9 to 15, you'll see forgiveness six times in this passage. Forgive, forgive, forgiveness, forgive, forgiveness, forgive. It's, it's written out clearly. Six times in eight verses. In fact, I believe the heart of this prayer leads right to this, this place, you know, where we come to the, to the Lord, forgiveness. Now, praise the Lord. As I said, I give my life to Jesus Christ. If you've given your life to Jesus Christ, we have, our sins have been paid for. Hallelujah. You've been washed. The Bible says, though your sins were scarlet, they've been made mighty snow. You're clean before the Lord Jesus Christ. In fact, that's a marvelous place to come to in your life if you haven't been there. That place of being released in judgment and condemnation and, and guilt is so freeing. You know, when you, when you come to the Lord Jesus Christ, you, you are changed. You're no longer condemned. You're no longer under judgment. You're now under the grace of God. You're no longer destined for that four-letter place, all right? You're, you're not going anywhere. It, it, uh, Gary's been preaching out of Romans 8, and there's that passage in there that says, you know, who, who can condemn us? Who can judge us? None. Only God can judge us, and he has, and he's just as forgiven. He's made us free. We've been declared pardoned. We've been declared forgiven. We've been declared, hey, even better, we've been made righteous. We've been changed in our life, Amen. So there's no human, no spirit, not Satan, no crowd, no individual that can bring any charge against me but God. And he brought him against the Lord Jesus Christ. So we come and we give our hearts to Christ and we're made free. But what about now that we are made free in the Lord Jesus Christ and we have sin in our heart? And this is what the Lord's dealing with here. We have been, yes, judicially forgiven of our sins, but we know even though we are, we are saved sinners, we're not sinless. You heard me say before, but we sin less. Any person who's just seeking to go on with God and really committed to the Lord Jesus Christ's life, they're not in trouble with sin as often as the person who's not doing those things, right? No? <laughs> you ought to try it. You'll find it's, you'll sin less, okay? <laughs> there won't be as much of that place in your life where you're spending half your prayer time repenting for stuff you shouldn't have done and you knew you shouldn't have done. That time will go a little faster in your prayer life. But we are clean before the Lord, but we do know that as Christians, we can still sin. We can still disobey God. Now, we've been freed. We don't have to do what we did. You realize that, right? You can't say the devil made me do it. Remember Flip Wilson? Those that are older than me used to have that comic comedic line. The devil made me do it. You can't use that, all right? Your mother made you do it. Your mama made you. Your husband made you. No, you're responsible. And God's given you freedom from the power of sin so you can live a righteous life. But all too often we choose sin over the righteous life. And this is where we're dealing with, I think this is where the Lord's taking us in this prayer. We have this judicial freedom. I've been forgiven my sins. And by the way, if you study the scripture, you'll realize that when Jesus shed his blood for our sins and said it's, it's, it's done, he paid the price for all sin, for all men, for all time. Can I say it again? He paid the price for all sin, for all men, for all time. Just a second. Okay. <laughs> Just wondering if y'all heard that, all right? I'm going to go back and sit down for a while, but y'all caught me before I got there. So I'm going to wait until it soaked in a little bit and you were able to, to, to chew on it a little bit. Praise God, man. What a blessing that all my sin for all time has, has been paid for. But what happens when I sin? Well, the, the Lord... Through, again, through the, through the work of the Holy Spirit, speaking to the Apostle John, he writes to us, if we say we have no sin, we are deceiving ourselves. He's talking to Christians here, okay? He's not talking to people without Christ. It's a letter to the church, and he says to them, if you say you don't have any sin, you're just deceiving yourself, and the truth's not in you. Now, if you look that up in the J-A-T translation, that's the Joe Arms translation, it says like this, if you say you don't sin, you're a big, fat liar. <laughs> All right? You're just not telling the truth. The truth's not in you. He said, but if we confess our sins, he's faithful and he's just 
to forgive us of our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Do you get the drift here, what the Lord's telling us to pray? The Lord's telling us we need to be praying about these sins that are going on in our life and getting them right with God, that we should be being serious about our walk with Jesus. We used the illustration of Jesus at the Passover meal. We, we preach on that, how Jesus goes in and he washes the disciples' feet right. He takes the towel. He did what they should have been doing, but he shows servanthood and he shows humility. But he's literally teaching a, a, a deep, deep lesson there as he goes through it. Because he comes to Peter, and Peter said he's so ashamed of not doing it himself, most likely. And he said, oh, Lord, I just need to be washed all over, you know. And he says to Peter, you don't need to be washed all over. He that is cleansed only needs his feet washed, all right? The idea here is saying, we now have this free life in Jesus Christ. We've been forgiven our sins, but if we've acted upon in such a way that we've sinned against the Lord as Christians, within our actions and our deeds and our activities and attitudes, then we need to bring those to the Father. In other words, the walk, the feet represented the daily contamination of sin that we expose ourselves to in our life or we, we commit in, in, in disobedience to the Lord. In other words, you don't need to be saved again, but you've got a walk that needs to be straightened out. You've got a life that needs to be dealt with, and you need to be praying, Lord, forgive us of our debts, all right? The dirty feet that was common, obviously, from walking the street, just it, it's, it symbolized the, the daily surface contamination of our heart with sin in our life. We have positionally, in other words, where we are in Christ Jesus, we have been forgiven all our sins. That, that occurred the moment I gave my life to Jesus Christ. But because every day, on some category, in some way, I will fall short of the Lord. Whether it's that intentional or not necessarily setting up in the day to say, I'm going to do this sin, but still do it. God wants me to come to him and confess those things to him. Why is it so hard, you know, for us to do that? Why is it so hard? I think some people kind of make a reservation because, well, well if, I, if, I, if I confess that, Lord, I'm probably going to do it again tomorrow, and I just really feel bad about confessing it. <laughs> Real confession doesn't treat it that way. Real confession is a little different. Some of say, well, you know, I, I, I'm just not a perfect human being, so I'm not, no. the Bible gives us a very clear word here. If we confess our sins, the idea is when we confess our sins. The idea goes even further that we should confess the things that are going on in our daily life that are not right with God and get them right with God. Praise God, we have a loving Father. Speaking of Father's Day, our Heavenly Father, you know, He's eager to forgive us. He wants us walking right in a right relationship with Him. He wants us serving Him. He wants us walking in fellowship with Him, all right? This is passage from Nehemiah that was written hundreds of years before Christ came. But here, even the, 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 the fatherhood of God was present in this, this prophet's heart and mind, this man of God. He says, Thou art a God of forgiveness, and you're gracious, and you're compassionate, slow to anger, and abounding in loving kindness. There's your Father's Day message, by the way. <laughs> this is the kind of dad, if you're a dad, that we should all long for to be this kind of dad. That we would be a, a dad of forgiveness, you know, gracious dads, compassionate dads. Slow to anger, abounding in loving kindness. I know as a dad, it's easy to get angry. Any dads in here ever get angry with your kids? Amen. You get angry, you get upset with them. But he says, you need to be slow to anger. Be angry and sin not. And sometimes the anger grows as they grow, all right? It's one thing to be angry because they spilt their milk versus when they just go out and do something intentional that's shameful when they, you knew they know better, right? And you, and you just, you know. Hey, get over it, all right? You sin, they sin. But God is gracious and God's compassionate, you know? He's slow to anger, abounding in loving kindness. That's the attitude in the heart I thank God for that he continues to show us so that when I do fail, all right, that I can come to him with a humble heart and say, God, I have sinned in this regard. Please forgive me. I surrender my heart to you. Wash me clean. The Bible says where sin abounds, grace much more abounds. What a glorious promise that is, because I know sin can abound around me. Am I the only one? There's four of us here today. All right. Where sin abounds, God's grace. Man's sin is pervasive. You think about the, the, the glory of God and the holiness of God, and seated in heaven in all his glory, and then you look at this pervasive, dark, dirty world that we live in with so much contamination of sin in it. You know, you just, you, how can God put up with this? He's a gracious, he's a compassionate God. No matter how much sin there is, he's got grace for it. But we have to come and seek the grace, which brings me to the plea part of this. 
we're asking for forgiveness. We're confessing our sins. If we confess that God is faithful and he's just. You know, Brother Joe, you just said God's a just God. Yes, he is. Well, the Bible says justice requires payment for sin. Yes, and it was carried out at the cross for Jesus Christ. So when you come to your sin, you can keep in mind somebody paid the price already so you can be forgiven. All right? Somebody's, somebody's done this already for you so you can come to the Father. Now, we've talked about it before, but let me reiterate it because I think it's important. Remember when it says confess, that is a word in the English language made up of two words, confess. Con meaning with, all right, associated something. You know, confess means to say up. Your people say, well, you need to fess up. All right, confess, to speak. So speak with, with speak. Speak with what? Speak with who? Well, speak with God. But it's not just speaking with God. It's speaking in agreement with God. God, I agree with you. I have sinned. You know it. God, I agree with you that this sin is ugly in your sight, and I know it. God, I agree with you that Jesus, your son, paid the price for my sin, and you're a just God. And God, I agree with you that you're a forgiving God, and I thank you for your forgiveness. That's, that's real confession. I think we get real specific about it, you know? When's the last time you got real specific with God about a sin? Maybe it's been a reoccurring sin in your life, and you've avoided specificity. That is the word, right? It sounded nice, didn't it? <laughs> you've avoided being real specific. Because it hurts when you think about it because you know you've offended the Father, you know, and you know it's causing you pain in your life. But to really get down and just get on your knees for the Lord, I confess this sin of, and God, I know you're, you, you abhor this in my life. And God, I know that you're a faith God. And catch this, I know that you sent your son Jesus to pay the price. Proverbs, 6, Proverbs 28 says, he who conceals his transgressions will not prosper. But he who confesses and forsakes them, he will find compassion. Here it is. It's confessing and forsaking. John Stott, theologian, said, one of the surest antidotes to the process of moral hardening is the disciplined practice of uncovering our sins, our sins of thought and outlook, as well as word and deed, and the repentant forsaking of them. In other words, if you don't want to become hard-hearted, keep before the Lord. Bring these things to the Father. Don't ever minimize. Don't ever rationalize. Just get real with God about this. Because the true Christian, when he looks at what God's done, this promise of forgiveness, they'll never look at it as a license to sin, a way to abuse God's love or presume on his grace. I remember there's a preacher friend of mine for years. We dealt with this issue of this forgiveness of sin and salvation and his general mindset and what he pre preached to his church was that you could lose your salvation, all right? And so ultimately you have to come back because you, there was, you could send to a point where you just lose salvation. No, he never could tell me what the point was where you came to to have to lose your salvation, you know. Uh, but I think God's view of sin is all sin is sin, all right? And so you had to get saved again. I'm not going into the theological depth because I'll be preaching on it in, in a couple months on security of believers. But the, the thing here is, he told me, and these were his exact words, he said, if I preach what you preach, he said, my people in my church would just go out and, conf go out and sin, do what they want to do, and then they'd come in later and confess it and go out and do it again. It's a license to sin. I said, not if they understand real confession. Confession is when you really get in the face of God, in the presence of God, and you really realize that someone... His son paid the price for that sin. And you realize what a terrible price had to be exacted upon Jesus Christ to pay for your sin. It was, you did it. He didn't. He paid the price. Then you won't, take, you won't look at grace like that. The Bible, in fact, tells us in Scripture that the grace of God teaches us that we should deny ungodliness and all unholy living and that we should walk obediently to the Lord. And be righteous with the Lord. So grace, when it's properly understood, helps you see the great grace of God. So much so that you see, it was my sin that caused Jesus to die on the cross. Is that, is that, is that hard to grasp? That, I think we really come back into an agreement. We start what it really means to confess. And we won't look at some kind of position and do what we want to do and sin how we, we want to sin. It's important to realize 
that as I confess my sin to the Lord, that he is ready to forgive me, but I must embrace this whole moment before him with humility. I'm wrong, God. You, you not only died to forgive me of these things, but you died so I wouldn't have to live with this. And here I am going back to this. It's wrong. Please forgive me. There was an old Puritan saint who wrote this many generations ago. Here was his prayer. Grant me never to lose sight of the exceeding sinfulness of sin, the exceeding righteousness of salvation, the exceeding glory of Christ, the exceeding beauty of holiness, and his exceeding wonder and grace. He went on to pray, I am guilty but pardoned. I am lost but saved. I was wondering but found. I am sinning but cleansed. Give me perpetual brokenheartedness. Keep me always clinging to the cross. Isn't that the message of grace and forgiveness in our sin? Now, this is the beautiful part. Once I'm forgiven, I, I need to receive the forgiveness. I don't need to walk out there in condemnation, all right? You know, you can't walk out like, I wish, I wish, I wish. I, I told Kathy the other day, I said, I'm, I'm working on a, 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 another song that's called, you know, Living in Real Time. You know? You say, what do you mean? Living in real time? You know? I said, how'd you come up with that? I, that, that, that? Well, I have one of those TVs you can back and fast forward, you know? You have one of those, right? You, you can just watch what you just saw before. But if you just change the channel, it hadn't had any time to, to, to get rewind. You know, at least nod your head, all right? You, know, you act like you don't have a remote in your house, all right? And she said, can you back up what I said. I said, I can't. It's in real time right now. That's how we need to live our life. We quit living with yesterday. You quit worrying about how it's going to happen tomorrow with fast forward. Or we can't fast forward and change a thing, do a thing. We need to live our life in real life. Well, we need to spend our time with God in real time. God, that's done. I'm not going to rewind. You don't rehearse it. You don't remember it. You cast it in the seal of forgiveness and your forgetfulness. I am going to join you in real time and live for you in the present and the day. Sufficient for the day is the evil thereof, Jesus said. Amen. Let's go on and be what God's called us today. We're going to be free today. We're going to serve the Lord today. We're going to be what God's called us to be today. Which leads us to ultimately the prerequisite, as we said, our final point. The prerequisite, Jesus gives it to us this. We also have forgiven our debtors. Here's another translation, contemporary version of Matthew 5. It says, citizens of God's kingdom are blessed and receive mercy because they themselves are merciful. Blessed are the merciful, for they shall also receive mercy. In other words, whatever seeds you're planting in your life, unforgiveness, bitterness, those are the things you should expect to get back because you reap what you sow. Let's try reaping from the seed of mercy. How do you do it? You sow the seed of mercy. To reap the seed of blessing, then you give the blessing. Now, he's not saying God doesn't forgive us because he said that just kind of goes with everything that you just said. But it, what it's saying is we will not experience the joy of our forgiveness if we hold on to these things. You, you, ever, you ever wonder when you read the Bible and you're, it sits there and it says Christians are this and you look around and say, I don't see like that. He says, you know, that the kingdom of God is righteousness, peace, and joy. I don't see any Christians really living in peace and joy, much less being righteous. You ever feel like you'd say, when is the Bible says, you know, Jesus said, out of your, out of your innermost being will, will, will spring a well of living water. You can't even get a squirt out of most. <laughs> Amen. You know, the only time they're going to have joy is when they find somebody might have bought their lunch at Wendy's. I don't know. <laughs> Where's the joy? Paul wrote the Galatian church, and he, he wrote to them, and they were getting off in all kinds of stuff. And he said, listen, where is this blessedness that you spoke of? We're, aren't we supposed to be filled with joy? Where's the joy in your life? Where's the victory? You know, where's that overcoming attitude? You know, where's, where's that glory resting on your life? The people look at you and say, man, they're different, man. They, they can walk through that with victory in their life. I think a lot of it's robbed right here. We don't experience it because we're not giving it. And if we reap what we sow, then certainly we're going to just reap our, the, 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 the worst of the worst. We're to be forgiving. Why? Because that's the nature of who we are as God's children. We should be acting like our spiritual parents and reflecting and acting and moving and giving mercy as we have received mercy. I know this is not always the most fun sermon to preach on. 
Why? Because you, my dear friend, are just like me, and I get offended easily. Not me. Yeah, sure, we all do. And, we're, and especially in church, we have relationships. How many people you know says, I'm not going back to church, they hurt me. Excuse me, did Jesus hurt you? It's his church, go back to church, all right? People are people. They're going to make mistakes. They're going to do stupid things. They're going to say stuff. You know, they're going to, in fact, sometimes I've discovered I don't have to do anything for somebody to get mad at me. <laughs> you have been there? How many of you have ever had somebody come up and say, I need to talk with you, okay? I just want you to know I'm forgiving you for. <laughs> and you're thinking, man, you must have the wrong person. I never thought that, never said that, never did that. Well, you didn't say it, but I could just tell you a minute. If they're psychic, they're really a bad psychic. <laughs> I mean, yeah, I mean, am I the only one who's ever experienced something like that? People come in and just, you know. So we can easily, is what I'm trying to make the statement, we can easily get hurt, we easily get offended, and we easily get c cross with each other. But we don't let that determine, you know, our relationship with each other. We choose to love, we choose to forgive, we choose to show mercy, we choose to overlook, we choose to say, you know, the Bible says love will cover a multitude of sins, you know. Hallelujah. If you do sin against me or I sin against you, ultimately, what can you do about it? You can't change me. I can't change you. God can. That's the missing element. Let's get him involved. Let's respond. Let's react. Let's do what he desires to do and see what he does in our life. Listen, I, I hear these messages on forgiveness. and I don't know if you have to agree with me or not, but I think I hear it probably a lot. I turn on my radio sometimes. I hear it from you know, things I get on, that I read in books and, you know, go, go to any marriage conference, you're bound to have at least one session on forgiveness, right? Why? Because you need it, all right? In marriage, why? It's a deeply personal relationship if you haven't discovered it. All right? It's easy to get hurt, your, your feelings hurt. Because who's going to hurt you more than those who love you? That's it. I mean, that's who hurts you the most in reality. So you have to learn to this, be, be this merciful individual. And all of us failed in consistency at times, you know, in, in our life. So what do we need? We need a constant exhortation like this. And that's why Jesus is talking about in the context of praying. This is obviously a daily prayer that he's talking about here. So we need to wash our feet daily, basically. Take our daily bread, but more so get our daily forgiveness if we've sinned against the Lord. And then if we have been and we've gotten right with God, then we extend the same kind of mercy, all right? We're to share the same kind of business, the same kind of forgiveness with others as we've received from the Lord. Be kind to one another, tenderhearted, forgiving each other, just as God in Christ Jesus has forgiven you. So he's done it for you, you do it for others. He's done it for me, I'll do it for you. He's done it for you, you'll do it towards me. And we'll forgive and we'll receive. Otherwise, we end up with that heavy baggage that we don't want to carry around. We should obviously be motivated to forgive because guilt's a nasty, horrible thing to carry around in our life. And so we want to get it right. Unforgiveness stands as a barrier to God's forgiveness is what he's saying here. It interferes with our peace of mind. It interferes with our happiness, satisfaction, and every, even functioning of our body can be affected by unforgiveness. Scientists tell us that, that bitterness creates all kinds of mental, emotional, and physical problems. The Bible said that long before scientists did all right? So we ought to believe what God has said and have this attitude to say, I want to be a forgiving person. I don't want to deal with this unforgiveness in my life because it's just going to bring a heavy piece of baggage that I really don't want to carry around. But forgiving others is a great benefit, not only to you, but the congregation of believers. I mean, probably a few things is, is, is so difficult in churches today is people that get at cross with each other, unforgiving with each other. I've seen churches split. I've seen ministries ruined and become ineffective uh, just because people won't get along because they, they choose to be independently selfish. They got it's my way or the highway attitude. You're going to do it my way or I'm not going to like you. That's just that's the, way I, it's the way I am. Well, the way you am needs to change. You, know, you need to get your heart right with God. You need to quit being so stubborn. You quit being so arrogant. You quit being so self-willed. Well, Brother Joe, I didn't come to church to hear that. I bet you didn't. <laughs> And I, I, 
this may really surprise you. I don't take a lot of joy in saying it. I don't set up at night saying, how can I offend everybody in church? Making a list. That might surprise you. I'm not that guy. But you can't help but when you open the Bible to see that there are things that are offensive to us if we stay selfish and in our sin. It's hard to hear, isn't it? But what happens when we embrace it with a humble heart? That's what I needed to hear, Pastor. That was the message that God was speaking to my heart even before I got here today. That was the word I needed to get, get a hold of. That was the reminder that I really needed to hear. That's the attitude we have to approach with. And because the church is a very personal business, if you want to use that terminology. It is an organism that depends upon each working part, working and loving and forgiving and caring, ministering and nurturing each and every other vital part. So forgiveness is an important part of the church life that we need to get a hold of and embrace. The Bible says in Psalm 66, if I regard iniquity in my heart, the Lord's not going to hear me. We even have a passage like that with bring husbands and wives in, 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 in Ephesians where it talks about Colossians where it talks about, hey, you know, it's first Peter, excuse me. So it might be second, but we'll give it a doubt. What's it say? He says, listen, you need to be right with each other so that your prayers will not be hindered. So what's he saying here? This attitude, independent spirit of unforgiveness creates a problem in your prayer life. So if you want to have an effective prayer life, you pray this way. Right? So he said, you regard others, all right, and forgive others, and you care about others. Why? Number one, it's going to keep you from being disciplined by God. What's it say in Hebrews? When there's this unforgiving spirit, there's sin, and where there's sin, there's chastening. You know what chastening is? Chastening is when you get a spanking. All right, I put that simplest term as I can find out. There's lots of ways to get spankings, all right? There's lots of disciplinary actions. It's not that God, ha God wants to do anything. There. It's just that God allows some things to happen that probably wouldn't have to happen if you just walked with, with a heart that's humble and a free spirit. And forgive. In fact, it got so bad the church of Corinth. There was so much division there. The Lord said, hey, you know, you guys are celebrating and having church and doing the Lord's Supper and communion and everything, but your hearts aren't right. And he said, because your heart's not right and you're going through all this. He said, you won't discern the body of Christ. He wasn't talking about their body. He's talking about their church. In other words, you're not right with other people in the church, and therefore, because you won't get right and you still come take communion, which represents our sin being taken away, you're still just going about it like normal with your own sinful, sinful heart. Says, no wonder you're sick. No wonder you're having all these problems and even dying. That's pretty serious, is it not, how God deals with this? The most important part, the most important reason for being that forgiver in your life, extending the forgiveness to other people, is what Jesus says here at the end. For if you forgive others their trespasses, your heavenly Father will forgive you. If you don't forgive them their trespasses, your Father is not forgiving you your trespasses. Now, let's back that up a little bit theologically because you may be thinking, well, Lord, you just, you just said that Jesus forgive me all my sins, paid the price for all my sins. Yes, it's all been done. But if I want it to be experiential, in other words, if I want to experience the joy, the freedom, the victory, the power in my life. And it's going to come from being responsible as a child of God who's received mercy to extend that mercy. I've never preached a message on forgiveness, but I always hadn't had somebody come up to me in the next day or days that followed and said something like this. But here's what happened to me. And shared something horrible. I mean, just horrible. And I'm thinking back in my mind, I wouldn't forgive them either. <laughs> you know, Kathy might. She's got the gift of mercy, you know. Me, get a rope. <laughs> Let's go deal with your problem. Because, there's, you know, people do some vile stuff, some hard stuff. But I understand that God's word is true for every situation. You don't need to be carrying that around. Having it happen was bad enough. Living in it is worse. Put that person in God's hands. He knows how to deal with it. And forgive them. Maybe you're like me. You, you've come to that place. You say, well, okay, I, I've sat in church and I heard that I, I need to forgive, so I'm going to forgive them. But then about 10 days later, you hear this little thought comes to your mind about the whole situation. And you start kind of reliving it in your mind. And you're thinking, I thought I forgave them. Listen, when you forgive, it doesn't mean you're not going to remember, all right? 
Even though the Bible says God is cast into sin for forgetfulness, it doesn't mean that God forgot. He's the eternal God, remember? It means he's chosen not to hold it against them. So you say, what do you do, Pastor? I always come back to this same thing. Somebody taught me a long time ago. When those kind of thoughts come up, I just turn to the devil and say, <clears throat> I clearly and distinctly remember forgiving that person before the Lord. It's settled. I'm not dealing with it in Jesus' name. And let it go. You'll find that has to happen a lot at first. <laughs> but the more you make those claim of faith, confessing what you've done before God, the more and greater the victory is going to be in your life. Experience and walk in God's grace and God's mercy and God's forgiveness. Puritan writer wrote this, Thomas Manton. He said, there's none so tender to others as they that have received mercy themselves, for they know how gently God hath dealt with them. Wow. Do we know clearly how God has dealt with our sin? How gently, ultimately, God really dealt with our wickedness? The more he says that you understand that in your own life, and it's amazing how you can extend that freely to other people's lives because the grace you received didn't cost you an ounce of blood, an ounce of work. It was the merciful grace of God. You want to learn how to pray? This is an integral part, being clean daily before the Lord and forgiving others the debts that they have against you like God forgave your debt against him. Let's stand together in prayer. This morning, perhaps you just want to make your way to the altar. Feel free to come now. Maybe there's somebody you, you haven't forgiven, you'll put it on the altar. Maybe there's some other need in your life you just want to spend a moment with the Lord. I, I know I went a little bit longer today, but I think this is an important topic for us. Amen. So let's have hearts that are open and available to the Lord. There'll be some people down here at the altar as well. Pray with you. If you want somebody to pray with you, maybe there's a need, something you're facing in your life, you want somebody to agree with you and pray about, feel free to come to anyone that's standing here in this altar today and pray with them. The Lord's available to meet our needs today. If it's you between you and your Heavenly Father, come. Be a part of what He's telling you to do by participating with Him. We have some couples that are here. If you want to come as a couple or even as individuals, if you want to come pray with one of them, feel free to come to whoever you feel led to pray with today, and we'll pray with you. God's a big God today. I cannot not help but believe if the Lord maybe puts someone or something on your mind, it would be a good time to lay out before Him. Father, we love you today, and we ask you in Jesus' name to just touch every heart, move upon every one of our lives, work in each one of us the way that will bring you the most glory and honor. We yield this time to you, our hearts to you. Father, we've heard from you and from your word. Father, we realize we have some steps we need to take. Lead us during this time in Jesus' name. Would you come? Would you obey the Lord? Whatever the need is, let's pray together. Let's trust the Lord.
but the blood of Jesus. Lord, we thank you for the precious blood of your Son, the Lord Jesus Christ. Father, thank you for mercy and grace. Thank you that you did pay the debt we couldn't pay. And your mercy continues to flow to our life daily, to wash us, to keep us clean. Help us to be tender-hearted in regard to our own personal sins and defilements. In Jesus' name, amen. Somebody say amen and praise the Lord. Is God good? How often? All the time? <laughs> Amen. Yes, he is. God has been so good to us as a church. Listen, uh, February got by me, and I didn't realize it until a few weeks ago, that in February of this year, the Stacy Dutton came on at 20 years now, all right? We can't call her secretary. She does more of an administrative assistant than secretary. I, I just, we have a little gift for you, Stacy. so come here. All right, praise the Lord. So, we love you. We appreciate you. you. She's the un, unsung and unseen hero around here, guys. And, uh, you know, the, just be glad that she knows how to keep a secret. <laughs> she told me she's writing a book if y'all ever mess her up. <laughs> Amen. But thank you, Stacy. You're a blessing. It's just, you know, words don't say it. Cards don't say it. A little gift there doesn't say it either. But we love you. We appreciate all you do for, for Jesus and for his kingdom. Anybody that can put up a Tim Strickland for that long, goodness gracious. So. <laughs> I'm sure it's easy working with me, right? Praise the Lord. But thank you again, and God bless you. You're up, Brother Gary. He knows when I go long, he goes at warp speed. So listen carefully. <laughs> Amen. Do have a couple of announcements. Of course, today being Father's Day, uh, there will be no uh, evening services tonight, uh, but we do have a Bible study coming up June 25th. There's been a change of location. Instead of having it down here in the Fellowship Hall, it will be upstairs in room 205 because of VBS next week. So ladies, ladies, I'm sorry, let me say that again. Ladies Bible study, June 25th, upstairs in room 205. Wednesday night service, you do not want to miss this Wednesday. We're going to be taking a deeper look at Romans 9, verses 6 through 13. And in those verses, Paul writes that our salvation is not based on natural birth, but based on God's sovereignty, amen? So just join us this Wednesday as we have just... I think we're having chicken salad sandwich, sandwiches and, and cookies. So come join us for just faith, food, and fellowship. We'll be in the fellowship hall as we continue our, our sum, summer sermon series. Also, we are looking. We are looking for qualified because we're looking for those that are called, right? God doesn't qualify the or doesn't call the qualified, he, he qualifies the called, amen. And so we're looking for two positions, one here at Spring, one at Magnolia. Uh, the, the position here is a part-time children's director. At Magnolia, we're looking for a part-time youth director. If you're interested, dr definitely drop your, your resume off at our church office here, Monday through Thursday, or send me an email at pastorgary at bfchurch.com. We'll look at it, and this is my HR hat, so let me put my HR hat on. Just because you submit a resume does not guarantee you an interview, okay? So, but if you're interested, definitely submit your resume. We'll look at it, and then we'll be giving those people a call. Father's Day bake sale. We do have a bake sale going on in, in, the, in the foyer out there. It's a little bit different than an auction. If you see something you like, give what you feel led to give, and then take it with you. Amen? Amen. So it's, you don't have to hang around for an auction. It's not silent. Just if you see something out there you like, drop some money in the, in the offer receptacle or, or give it to Pastor Matt and then take the gift. Now, this, these, this money goes towards kids' camp, and it costs more than $10 to go to camp. It costs more than $20 to go to camp. Amen? They probably spent that on per, buying or, or making these, these baked goods. So just keep that in mind as you're, as you're giving. Amen? And, and Ken, don't worry about it. I got your chocolate cake out there. It already has a reserve sign for you. Amen. Happy Father's Day to all the fathers. We have a special gift for you. As you leave out of any of the doors, uh, there's, a, there's a gift for you. So if all the fathers in attendance. Now, 
I'm glad if you're going later to go see your dad or have a lunch with them, but these gifts are for fathers that are in attendance, amen? So we have a gift for you out there. So if you're a first-time visitor and you're a father, you get two gifts because if you give, uh, if you uh, go to the Welcome Center at the end of church and you give uh, Miss Linda your welcome card with your name, number, and email address, she'll give you another free gift. So you could potentially walk out of here with two gifts, Amen. You can't go, you cannot beat that. And for members, don't fill this out and act like it's your first time. All right. I already tried that. Didn't work. So also we have plenty of food and dry goods in the food pantry. Make sure you go by there and, and, and take some items from the food pantry. Finally, again, uh, we say this every Sunday. We don't pass the plate around here. We do have offer receptacles in the back. And it is an act of worship. God has blessed us, amen. And so let's just be reminded that we also should give our first, the first of our first fruit, our fruits, amen. Three ways to give, in person, mail, and online. So with that being said, happy Father's Day. Did I say everything I needed to say? You are dismissed. <laughs>